Welcome back to another Freight Burger Bootcamp Live. It's Monday at noon. Thank you for joining me today. I have a special guest. I'm going to introduce him in here in a minute or so. And the topic, this is a Freight Broker success interview. Not only is he a past student of Freight Burger Bootcamp, but he's also an Army veteran, right? Okay, so he's a veteran. And we're going to talk about how he went from being in the Army to doing over $235,000 in sales in just one month, right? In one month, all right? He's going to talk about that journey, talk about kind of how that whole journey, right? Mainly, we're going to talk about how he, he started his brokerage a few years ago and some of the trials and tribulations, some of the success he's had. Um, but before we do that, before I introduce my guest, um, we're going to let a few people get live. Hit me up in the comments with the city and state you're logging in from. I'd love to hear from you. We'll try to do some shout outs. And then uh, we will get the interview and get the ball rolling, okay? So hit me up in the comments. Let me know what you got. Let me know the city and state you guys are logging in from. And then we'll dive into the interview. We've got Ozan from Lincoln, Nebraska, as always. Ozan, thank you so much. He's always here every single week. And you guys should check him out. He posts good stuff on LinkedIn as well. Uh, Ryan Merce from Lancaster, PA. Rebecca from Odessa, Texas. Noah from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Jason in the Army. All right, love it. All right, Jomo Mighty from Florida. We've got Sandra Akata from Twin Falls, Idaho. We got Asim from Istanbul, Pakistan. We've got Petula from Las Vegas, Nevada. We've got Michael 46 from Orlando, Florida. We got El Padre Fernandez from Lehigh Valley, California, uh, PA. Maria McCarthy from Gillette, Wisconsin. Larry Rowland from Amarillo, Texas. Torrance Turner from uh, Louisiana or from LA. I'm assuming Louisiana. Uh, Rico Brown, Greenville, South Carolina. Welcome. Um, Harsh Jassar from Shandigar, India. Awesome. Jeez, we got Pakistan, India, the US. We got Laura Crate from Georgia. We got Gloria from Castleberry, Florida. Andy Frades from Fontana, California. And Michael Whew. McLaughlin from Zephyr Hills, Florida. We've got Prob from California. We've got Randy and Sandy Mc, McWhorter from Knoxville, Tennessee. If I murder your name, I apologize. These things are going up on the screen really fast and they're small type. Mike from Dallas, Texas. Timothy McNeil from Detroit, Michigan. John Ramirez. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Today, we're going to have a Freightbroker success interview. And the topic is how my guest went from being an Army veteran and starting zero as a freight broker to doing over $235,000 in one month. Okay. So we're going to talk about that journey. Again, the agenda is going to be this. We're going to do the interview and then uh, we will do Q and A on the back end. All right. So uh, assuming my guest has some time, I think he'll stick around. We're going to do the interview. Then we're going to do Q and A. So if you have questions for me or my guest, stick around to the end and we'll make sure that we try to answer your questions best we can. So, Without further ado, let's introduce my guest. Welcome, my friend, Jeffrey Price. Thank you for being here today. Hey, thank you for having me, Dennis. I appreciate you as well, sir. Yeah, where are you based out of, Jeffrey? Columbus, Ohio, right now, the heart of the United States, so to speak, the heart of it all. Love it. Yeah, you're not that far from me. What are you, probably about maybe five, six hours away, something like that, from Buffalo? Yes, yep. Awesome. Yep. Are you born and raised there, or are you transplant? I know you're in the military, so you travel a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I was born here in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and like we say, the Midwest is just a home of manufacturing and all kinds of stuff right here. So it's a great place to be and a great place to have a freight brokerage as well. Love it. Well, listen, thank you so much for being here. Give us a quick intro. You have an interesting background. Take a minute or two and talk a little bit about your background, you know, kind of a little bit of your army background and how you transitioned out and then eventually how you jumped into becoming a freight broker and why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to summarize about 12 years in less than two minutes. So long story short, I joined the United States Army Reserves back in 2012. My MOS, which is Military Occupational Specialty, which is just your Army job, so to speak, was a transportation management coordinator. So that really got my foot in the door doing transportation logistics understanding how to get things from the right place at the right time and for the right price 
all those Army Corps values. So um, once I picked that MOS, I did extremely well, got out of boot camp and went straight to a deployment in Afghanistan um, where I just did amazing things doing transport logistics, working in dredge, getting containers in, in Afghanistan out to the United States or whatever other military bases they needed to go to. So that got me the intro about trucking. We did truck driving ourselves if we were short on drivers, working with different ethnicities, cultures, nationalities, as you do, doing a freight brokerage. And then uh, once I redeployed, I got a job working with a major freight brokerage. So that's where I learned both what I do want to do and what not to do. But that's where I kind of got the ground of finding carriers, what to expect, and really planted the seed for me to where I knew I wanted to go back and start a freight brokerage from the ground up. So I was there for about almost a year, left there, got a job at Honda doing global transportation logistics. So at this point, I'm doing the exact same thing I did in the military, just doing it for Honda as well. I was there for until 2020. Once COVID hit, they had me doing um, inbound, outbound procurement, which is just purchasing parts, as well as packaging and warehouse management because they furloughed everybody in North America, except for those in global supply chain, because as you know, other countries were still running production, China, Japan, India, since COVID hit at different times. And at that point, if I can be trusted with a billion dollar decisions working for this company, I might as well go ahead and do it for myself. So I uh, took the leap of faith, started the company in 2020, left in 2021 because I realized the company can only grow as much as I can put into it as far as time goes, which you talk about all the time, Dennis. So left in 2021, first year we did about 135,000. Last year, we did close to a million, and we're on pace to double that this year. I love it. And listen, before we move forward, thank you so much for your service. I should have said that at the very beginning because I don't want that to go without recognizing that. That's very, very important. So I appreciate that, and I'm sure a lot of the listeners do as well. Um, and thank you for that quick background. I mean, you've got a, a really interesting background, you know, military, uh, transportation related logistics. And then converting over into the into the private sector, working for a brokerage, and then working on the shipper side. So I love the progression, and I think it's very natural that a guy like you, if you're entrepreneurial and really want to kind of, you know, control your own destiny, how you would, how and why you would start your own freight brokerage. So I I think the why is there, and I think the how you got started is there. And congrats! I think you said you did uh, a little. You you're on pay. You're already this year. Over half a million, you're on pace to do over a million dollars in sales in 2023, right? Correct. Correct. Love yes. it. Okay, yes. great. All right. So let's talk about the startup because when you started, you started part time, which is unusual, right. right? So you had a career, you had a job, you had a full time job, but then you were doing this part time. Talk to us a little bit about some of the challenges that you faced there and and how that went. Yeah. So starting it off part time, you know, because in my heart, I kind of felt like other people to where it's like, oh, I'll just start a freight brokerage and do it part time since I had a really high paying job working at Honda as a global transportation manager to where I was making six figures. But it was like kind of hard to walk away from that in the beginning. So, you know, getting started, especially with a freight brokerage from the ground up, it's more than just getting the MC number and getting trucks. You know, I knew from working at that mega brokerage, I needed to have some cash. Because starting off, nobody's really going to work with you. I could get a high paying low, but carriers still aren't going to work with you without having business credit and things of that nature. So the reason why it took me so long to transition is I needed capital, right? I needed capital to pay carriers up front and just to really run the business until I had business credit and I was factorable through factoring companies. So that was really the hardest trying point for me. You know, I was making my pitch to investors saying, look at my background. Graduated from the Army Transportation School, 100% on every test, all this experience leading up to it, but nobody would take a chance on me. So literally what my wife and I did was we put our house on the line. We took out a home equity line of credit for $100,000 to fund the company, to have the money to pay, wow. buy, to pay for carriers, things of that nature. And that's how we were able to really jumpstart it because now we had the cash to pay carriers up front do those little small things until we have business credit established. Yeah. So you really had some skin in the game. And I know that some, some startups do struggle with getting carriers to do business with them. You know, a lot of times people go to factoring companies, 
you know, we've talked about that in my trainings. We've talked about that on different interviews on my YouTube channel, how to try to build that credit up quickly. Um, a matter of fact, I think we had Elio Longoria on, he was an interview from a couple of years ago, how he talked about, he did over $7,000 in profit his first week and how he was able to stumble through that early stages of getting people carriers to extend them credit. So it is possible, but there are some challenges there. But the interesting is, the interesting thing is, Jeffrey, is that you went all in, right? I mean, you took a, not only did you quit your job, but you took a hundred thousand dollar line of credit on your home. Yeah. And now things get very real, right? They get very real because now you got mama involved, right? You're married. Now you're putting the house on the line yeah. and uh, things get real serious. She's probably not complaining about you putting a few extra hours in at work yeah. when, uh, when you've got that much skin in the game. Yes. And, and, you know, as an entrepreneur, we talk about that a lot and you do too. You need to really have that skin in the game to have that passion to push you through the hard times. I say all the time, this industry is not for the faint of heart. If you can't persevere or have a bigger why or purpose behind you, you know, I got to look at my wife every day and say, hey, we took out this home equity line of credit. I have to succeed. You know, there's no turning back at that point. And sometimes we need to be in a position where there is no turning back in order to really be successful. Yeah, it's funny because I tell the story. I, I got married on September 27th, 2003. I started my freight brokerage. I incorporated my freight brokerage on October 3rd, 2003, six days later. I was newly married, didn't really have a whole lot of money coming off of a failed, a failed business. And my wife wanted to start a family. So I get it. I get it. You know, I burned the boats, as they say, and I went all in. And, you know, for some people, that's the right thing to do. You took a phased approach. I think that's really interesting. And, and you know, not able, not everybody's able to pull that off part time to try to get that little bit of a jump start. So kudos to you for for that. And then kudos to you for, for quitting a six figure job. I mean, you had a really nice job at Honda that most people would never quit. I mean, you know, like you said, it's hard to quit a job like that, right? Right. You know, you've got a, a well-established multi-billion dollar company. You're making a great income in an industry that's, you know, that's, a, you know, like a staple in the world, right? Everywhere cars are, are you know, the Honda's known everywhere. So, so congrats on that. So talk to us about the kind of once you, once you burn the boats and you went full time, talk to us a little bit about how you got your first customers. Talk to us a little bit about how you were able to get your first customers. What a lot of referrals? Was it people you had done business with at Honda? Was it people from the military? Was it cold calling, LinkedIn? How were you getting your customers? Yep, so at this point, honestly, I had one battle buddy. He was in my army unit. I told him about the idea. I said, look, man, I'm about to start this company from the ground up. And he was like, I feel like this is for me. I'm gonna do it with you. So, you know, when I tell my testimony, I'm like, this guy quit his job and came with me before we even had a shipper. Right. So I say, like, dude, you're way crazier than me. But um, anyway, what we did was, you know, we just hopped on the phones. I mean, literally, we looked at companies that were military friendly because, you know, we were pushing being a veteran owned business off top. You know, we already had that certification to be a veteran owned small business. That was easy for me to get just submitting that through the SBA, the Small Business Association. And then just running with that. So finding companies that were military friendly, because then when I'm making our outbound calls, my pitch, as you say, Dennis, doesn't sound like everybody else. You know, I'm starting with like, hey, I'm a veteran on freight brokerage, started a company from the ground up or something along those lines, really draw them in to where the first thing they're going to say is pro more, more than likely is thank you for your service. But now I have them on the phone. Now we can talk a little bit more. Now we can have more discussions. So our first shipper he was in Afghanistan the same time I was in Afghanistan. And we went through thousands of calls before we found him. And that company gave us $450,000 in business last year. So in this industry, you don't really need a lot of clients. You just need the right client. And because he was in Afghanistan when I was, honestly, Dennis, the first time we talked, we didn't even talk about transportation. We're sharing stories about the deployment and all that stuff you go through being a soldier. And he honestly just spoon fed his business to where he's coming to Columbus tomorrow and I'm taking him out to a steakhouse. So, I mean, that's the way you really just build relationships 
as you always preach yourself. Yeah. What I love about that is you didn't get on the phone and say, Hey, I'm the greatest freight broker. Hey, I can save you a bunch of money. Hey, I've got trucks in your area that need to be loaded. You didn't, you didn't go the old school route of just sounding like everybody else, you know, but you also didn't have to departure that much from it. What you did was you found uh, an asset that you had, which is your military background you targeted people that you knew that asset would be, would, would get some sort of a favorable reaction, you know, that they would be compelled towards it. And then you leveraged it. And then you built rapport using that. That was the foundation of your entire sales process was building rapport using your veteran military army experience. And, you know, like you said, you don't need to have, see, most people think when they start this business, oh, you know, I got to go out and get a hundred customers or 200 customers. Listen, the reality is if you've got five to 10 average customers, now I'm not talking about, you know, Honda, I'm not talking about, you know, Honda is your customer or Pepsi, your customer, or US Steel, average customers, you're sticking six figures in your pocket right? I mean, in profit, I mean, you don't need hundreds of customers. So I think that's important for people to understand. So I'm glad you said that, you know, I obviously, you know, I had a, I had a a, a video recently, I did a training about not putting all your eggs in one basket. I told the story about how the freight broker had over a million dollars in sales and he only had one customer and he lost it. He almost went bankrupt. So you do want to diversify that. So I highly recommend diversification, but to get started, if you get three, four, five shippers, you're, you should be off to the races as long as you take care of that business because it's all about repeat business. Yeah, and absolutely. And just another part of the testimony to that, the first month that I started, you know, really cold calling, I got in front of, you know, a cop, not a Costco, I'm sorry, what's the name of that company? Slipped my mind, but it was one of those big uh, grocery chains. And, you know, when I met with them, my rates couldn't even match the rates they were getting because I was too new. So I, I would suggest to anybody who is just starting, don't go after those billion dollar companies because it takes a long time to get a big fish like that. One of my biggest customers, it took me eight months and they're a big fish. They're a billion dollar company. But it took me eight months just to be registered with them for me to build that trust for them to give me business. And now it's consistent. But again, eight months, I, I, I'd much rather start with a company under, you know, maybe even 50 million or 25 million. And you'll still make six figures off of that easy and you won't have all that competition as well. And you won't be in a situation where it's a race to the bottom. And that's really the worst to be in. Yeah. In the freight brokerage business, large shippers, high volume shippers need brokers the least. And here's why. Yep. Because number one, all of the big brokers compete for high volume freight. Yep. All of the big carriers compete for high volume freight. Exactly. And they have budgets and they have the resources to hire really solid talent to build out their own logistics team internally. Yep. So it's not that you can't do business with them, but for, especially for a startup or small broker, it's not where you're needed most. Where you're needed the most is in the small to medium sized shippers that are looking to grow and have strained resources, right? Yep. Maybe they're growing through acquisition, right? They had just acquired another company. They wanted to go from a, you know, a $50 million company to a $100 million company. They're doubling in size. That's a challenge on the logistics side, whenever there's an acquisition or whenever you're rolling out new products or new markets. That's where the opportunity lies in logistics, right? It's not just getting the freight that they've been running day in and day out. When they're growing, that's when they have strained resources. That's when they need you the most. So those are the types of companies that, you know, the companies like you said, that are doing 25 or 50 or even $100 million in sales. The reality, guys, I know it's hard to believe, but a $100 million company is not a big company in the big scheme of things, right? If you're under a $100 million company, you're considered a small company. So I know that's, you know, challenging, especially when you're sitting here in a startup and you're trying to scratch two nickels together to hear that. But the fact is, that's the reality, especially if you're in the manufacturing, import, export, if you're producing something, right? All right, cool. So let's talk a little, let's pivot over and talk a little bit about your niche. When you first started, what was the first type of freight that you were moving? What was your niche? What did you identify as that freight niche? Yep. So when I first started, I keyed in specifically on dry van. And more specifically, the reason why is, you know, just from my previous experience working as a freight broker for a mega brokerage, what you got to understand is to each niche, there's a cost associated with it, right? So say if you're like, hey, I just want to go jump right into reefers. 
Well, are you prepared to pay for detention, layovers, and all the things that go along with produce running to those areas? Same thing with flatbeds. Are you prepared to deal with drivers who want to tarp and do all this other stuff that comes along with it? So with dry vans, you know, there's less of those variables that are out there and there's more dry van trucks than anything. So I knew for me, let me focus on where there's a lot of trucks, where there's a lot of new carriers getting into it to where I can find carriers to actually move the freight. So I specifically started with industries or companies that needed dry van freight. And since then, now we do drayage, now we do construction, pickup trucks, all kind of stuff now. But primarily, dry van is where I got started, and that's the reason why. So you picked one niche, you started doing business in that niche, and then you strategically expanded into some other niches. I know you said drayage was a lot of what you did in the military. Yeah. So that's probably what attracted you to do that here, right, to, in your freight brokerage, because you you knew the lingo and you knew kind of from the buyer and the seller side, right? You've worked that. So it was something that you knew. So it was a lot easier for you to expand into other niches than than a typical startup freight broker who doesn't have that experience. But the fact is, you, the reality is, in order to build a seven-figure business, a, a million-dollar-plus company, you don't need to serve everybody, right? You're better off being a big fish in a smaller pond than a really small fish in a big pond. Because the problem is, is the noise in that big pond will drown out your message. But it's easier to differentiate yourself when you focus in a specific niche, right? So I love that. Was there a geographical component to it? Did you focus on Ohio, Midwest? Was there, or, or did you really just kind of canvas the whole van market trying to get some traction? Yeah, I focused on the Midwest and uh, really looking for shippers that did over the road because I would make the most money from it, right? If it's something over the road that I'm adding 10 to 15% and it's like $3,000, for example, I'm going to make more money compared to if it was like the shorter runs, things of that nature. So I primarily focused on the Midwest um, out of a base to start out of and because I could go there in person, right? If I need to go visit somebody in Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, I could travel and do a face-to-face -face meeting because a lot of times in sales, people want to work with somebody who can communicate well, who they actually like and want to do business with. So that was the reason why I started off there and really looking at over the road because I had the most opportunity for the most money. So you would use the phone to start building that initial rapport and dialogue. And then in the event that it went to that phase and you thought there was a viable opportunity for you and there was a level of interest, then you would possibly go visit them to try to move the sale to the next step. Exactly. Yes, sir. Love it. Why yeah, so you're you leveraging your time, but you're also not afraid to jump in your car and drive a few hours if there's a really strong prospect. Of course, you're going to try to set up multiple meetings on that day to and fro. But but um, yeah, but I, I agree. I mean, being face to face can have a huge impact. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, just, you know, a lot of things with success is are you willing to do things that other people won't do? And with that time with COVID just ending out, warehouses just opening up in that startup period, a lot of people wouldn't want to meet face to face. So even just being courageous enough and say, hey, I'll come out to you and things of that nature, bring some donuts or some food, because that really wins people over when you feed them. Um, it's worked for us. Yeah, I love it. Great. All right. So we talked about your startup story. We talked a little bit about your revenue. We talked about your freight niche. We talked a little bit about your how you got the customers, right? Because you were picking up the phone. Um, tell me, what did you learn? What was some of your biggest lessons in that initial sales outreach? right? You told me how you used your military background to build rapport. But if there's one or two lessons that you learned that you could, that you took away from that experience in those first 500 or thousand phone calls, right? Which is the most challenging calls for any salesperson. What would be a couple of those lessons or what are the couple of those tips you might be able to share with the audience? Yeah. A couple of lessons that I learned from that is um, first off, pushing through the no, you know, normally people are kind of triggered just to say no, but really just pushing through that, pushing through the objections and also having the mindset that if you answer the phone, you have the time to talk to me. Because if I'm too busy, I'm just not going to answer my phone. I think you might have said that in one of your correct minutes. But if you pick up the phone, you better hang up on me because I'm not going to end that call. So really just being able to persevere from there. Um, the follow up. There's so much in the follow up. I can't tell you how many times that I reached out to a shipper that they said no, but I took that as not yet. And just kept following up, having a good cadence, a good rhythm just to follow up with them and getting those different touch points 
as you've taught, just on LinkedIn, a call. And sometimes it's just a different voice. You know, I might have my wife or somebody else call because maybe, you know, my voice was a little strong, a little too passionate, a little too fiery. <laughs> then they call with a softer tone and they got further in the call. So just really being strategic and using just good communication skills. Um, that's what I found that works. I love it. Yeah. I think those are two really valuable lessons. I mean, what you have to expect going into this business is you are going to hear the word no. You are going to get rejection. But that's the same in any business. Okay. There's going to be a lot of rejection. You got to fight through that first one. The getting your first shipper is the hardest one. Moving that first load is your hardest one. I've talked about that with other guests in the past. And um, and so if you can get past that, you know, you're going to walk around, you're going to stick your chest out, you're, you're going to build your confidence. All of a sudden, it's real because that load picked up and delivered. And now all of a sudden, you're invoiced the shipper and it worked. You made $100 or $200 or $300. And you know, if you can do it once, you can do it twice. And if you can do it twice, you can do it 10 times. And then the next thing you know, you're doing it 10 or 20 or 30 times a week. And now you got a business, right? Yeah. So I love that. Um, yeah, those are some really great lessons. I, what what was? Let's talk about some of the mistakes you made because I've made more mistakes than I can count. And you know, I, I tell everybody I've made millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of mistakes, lost millions of dollars in dumb things that I've done. Not only dumb things, but things that I didn't realize were mistakes until after the fact. Talk to us a little bit about one or two of the mistakes maybe you made so that our audience might be able to avoid those in advance. Yeah. So the biggest mistake that I've made is there are a lot of pirates in trucking. You know, you might hear a lot of carriers bashing brokers, but there are some crooked carriers out there. So, you know, we founded our first shipper. And with that first shipper, probably about five loads in it was, um, when unfortunately I had a load that was a double, double broker. Um, the carrier ended up Taking the low, it was from Indiana to California. So that's a hot spot for being brokering just because there's a good rail system out there. A carrier, he picked it up, gave it to another carrier, threw it on the rail, and then it finally delivered three weeks later. So in that meantime, I'm still keeping in touch with the shipper. They had, they advised that they weren't going to pay me for the low because of what happened. So I ended up paying for the low out of pocket, but because I kept the communication up, reached out to the shipper, let them know what was going on, negotiated with the carrier because I had to prepay them or they weren't going to deliver it at all. The foot low got delivered. And because I handled the situation so well with integrity, we still kept the client. And that's actually happened to, to me twice with the same shipper. So, I mean, that's the biggest thing I've learned from that, just to vet carriers harder. I'm, I'm real hard on vetting carriers. You know, when we first started, you, it was really hard to even find somebody to work with us. But now I just vet them. I drill them. If you're not giving me that driver's number or information ahead of time, I won't work with you. I've taken carriers off a load the day of, hours before the load picked up, because I'd rather risk missing an appointment time than getting it double brokered and not knowing where my stuff is. So um, those are the biggest lessons that I've had to take or pain points that I've gone through. Yeah, vetting carriers is a really critical part of this. And believe it or not, I mean, this is one of the services that brokers provide for shippers, right? Is taking the extra time to vet carriers. You got to understand a shipper when he's inside his operations, he's wearing multiple hats. He's got, you know, it's in a lot of times it's controlled chaos, right? If you're, especially if you have any sort of volume of shipping that's taking place, you know, or even if you're just a shipping manager in a small to medium sized company, you got two people that didn't show up today. The forklift is broke. You know, you got all kinds of challenges. And so they don't have time to vet all the carriers if they're going to effectively move the freight that day, especially when there's challenges. So brokers vetting carriers is a really important part. But but what Jeffrey said about, you know, the potential fraud or scams or or unethical carriers are out there. I mean, the fact is they're out there. So you got to know that going in. Um, but if you follow a few simple steps, I think I did an entire training on some things to make sure you're vetting the carriers properly. Um, I mean, there are some tools out there like Carrier 411. There's some other tools out there that you can use like the TIA Freight Guard. I mean, there's some other things like that that will help you to see and get some transparency into the fact whether that MC has a really bad rap, a bad history. 
Um, and that will save you tons of time and aggravation. Like you said, you'd rather not uh, move the load than to put it on a carrier that's not going to do it the right way or is going to jeopardize your shipper or the load or whatever the case may be, because that's your, that's your reputation at that point. Exactly. exactly. And like you said, I had to put countermeasures in place to keep that client as far as I had to get a, member, a membership to carrier 411 because I didn't have that at first. I know you mentioned it in your training, but I must have missed that page. Um, I did join the TIA as part of that um, countermeasures. So I did have to put some more investments and put solid um, processes in place. And that's what helped retain that client when they saw like, OK, mistakes happen. But this guy really went above and beyond to make processes in place so it won't happen again. So that's and you owned it. And you took responsibility for it, right? But what a lot of people do in business is they'll point fingers while well, he or she or they, right? Ultimately, the responsibility is yours. You have to own it. What I've found, the best way to disarm a customer that's upset about something that happened during your transaction is to just take ownership of it. Yep. And at that point, focus on the solution. And at that point, you can sort out all the he said, she said on the back end. But if you take ownership of it, you know, it disarms them. And now you can focus on solving that problem. Right. And that's really just a very basic one on one approach to it. Um, and I did misspeak. I think it's uh, carrier 411 is freight guard. And then the TIA has watchdog. Right. It's the watchdog report. So, yeah, I would highly recommend either of those. You guys use those. Um, check them out. And the TIA is a great organization. I was a part of it. I had that was a part of my brokerage from day one. So. All right, great. Well, listen, um, we're going to do some Q&A. Is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we wrap up today? Is there anything that you want to tell them? Um, I know you were a student of Freightburger Bootcamp. You went through the training. You know, you've had a really interesting journey. Um, give us some parting words and then we'll jump into Q&A. Yeah, I, I just want to encourage everyone that's just starting off that if I can do it, you can do it too. You know, I don't have a college degree. I don't have any fancy titles behind my name. But what I do have is I communicate well, I'm honest, I have integrity, and just those core principle values of just being a good person will take you far in this industry. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people who will backstab and thieve and lie their way to the top. But if you are just a good, genuine person, which is good core moral values, you will be successful in this industry. And just to really stick to it and persevere, and I guarantee you'll be a next uh, person on Dennis's program as well. Yeah. I love it. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I appreciate it. Congratulations on all your success. You know, it's, it's really amazing. I love to see good things happen to good people. So thank you for being here. And listen, if you guys are curious about becoming a freight broker or a freight agent, you want to take the course that Jeffrey took, go to freightbrokerbootcamp.com, trained over 10,000 students, um, had lots of success stories, including guys like Jeffrey. I did a very small part of that. He did all the hard work, but we helped him get started in the early days to build his confidence Again, you can check that out at FreightBrokerBootCamp.com. We offer a 60-day, 100% unconditional money-back guarantee. Check that out at FreightBrokerBootCamp.com. All right, cool. So let's jump into some Q&A. All right, we'll jump into some Q&A. We'll see what happens. Um, so if you guys have questions, here's what I would suggest. If you have a question for Jeffrey, say, Jeffrey, help me with, or can you answer? If you want me to answer it or you want both, whatever the case may be, type in the chat box, hit us up. we got a little bit of time to do some Q&A. We'll be glad to try to answer any questions you have. If we don't know the answers, we'll try to point you in the right direction. But I think you, between Jeffrey and myself, we should be able to kind of point you in the right direction on most topics. All right. So Ozan has a question. First of all, thank you for your service. Yes. Uh, what do you do differently today than three years ago? What's the biggest change about the industry from your perspective? Okay, so first question first. I think this is for you. What do you do differently today than you did when you first got started? Yep, the biggest thing that I do differently is I took Dennis's sales um, accelerator course. I never knew about LinkedIn, right? I never knew about LinkedIn. I didn't know how to market myself on LinkedIn. I thought LinkedIn was just where people went to look for jobs or post their resumes. I took his course optimize my LinkedIn profile, uh, work with a marketing company to help me make a good headshot, things of that nature. So made another investment there. And now I've done over a million dollars close to because of just LinkedIn connections, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, sliding in the DMs of procurement managers, shipping managers, receiving managers. And that's been the way I've really optimized growth because I'm not really on the phones as much anymore, just because of, just because of life in general and where the business is now. 
but I'm still heavily on LinkedIn uh, reaching out to people. Love it. And listen, if you guys want to get on the wait list, I'm going to be reopening my freight broker sales accelerator very soon. Okay. But if you're not on the wait list, there's probably 0% chance you will be able to be involved. The wait list doesn't cost you anything. You'll get be the first to be notified once I open it up. That's the other program that uh, Jeffrey went through. Uh, a lot of my Students who have been on these interviews have went through the Freight Broker Sales Accelerator. I don't think it's an accident. <laughs> um, so check that out. You can get down the wait list for that. Um, and LinkedIn, uh, said, like he said, I think LinkedIn is the is a what I call a target rich environment. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a lot of opportunities there, but there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And so you and, and you will get vastly different results based upon that. Okay. So yeah, um, I totally agree. I think that's a, I think that's a great tip. Um, and then the se I think there was a second question there, wasn't there? Let me see. I think I took it down. Hold on a second. The second question was a part of that was what's the biggest change about this industry from your perspective? What do you what have you seen change in the industry in the time you've been involved? Well, I think a lot recently is you know rates have kind of gone down mm -hmm. as far as the shipper side. So what I've done to kind of combat the rates going down is even though um i've brought the rates down to my customers as well which is really unorthodox for a freight broker to say hey even though we are moving this for a thousand dollars i know the rates went down some let me pass that cost saving to you as well voluntarily though like right. they didn't ask me to bring it down but i said hey the market's changing rates are going down i'm going to bring down my charge as well and because i did that they gave me more business so you know you always got to think of if a shipper is giving you loads they probably have about 20 or 30 loads that they have in their back pocket that maybe you just haven't built the trust yet or the relationship with for them to give it to you. So that's really the biggest change in industry is the rates going down, but being transparent enough with my customers to pass that cost savings to them too. Yeah. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The biggest obstacle to getting shippers is not price. It's trust. And what you just saw Jeffrey do, he wasn't the cheapest to get the business, but the fact is when he, when he was doing business with him, what he did is he became very proactive and offering that, that decrease in rates because they knew the rates were going down because fuel's going down and freight tonnage is down and truck capacity's up. Everybody knows that game. And so he voluntarily took that to him. And what did that do? that built an extra layer of trust. He had this trust level before. And as soon as he voluntarily offered that rate decrease, even though he was, you know, could have stuck that in his pocket, what he did is he brought his trust level up to here. And that's how you build those relationships. Okay. Being proactive and transparent and honest, right? And not a lot of, not a lot of, whether it be brokers or carriers or business people in general, not a lot of people would have done that. So kudos to you. He's playing the long game right? He's not in it for an extra hundred bucks today. He understands the lifetime value of a shipper. Yeah. And you're talking, you know, he told you that the, I think the first year or one of the first years he had last year, I think it was, you said you had one shipper, you did over like a few hundred thousand dollars with one shipper. Right. So guys, let's, let's, let's cast that out 10 years, 10 years times 300 grand. That's $3 million. If it doesn't grow at all, think about that. Think about five and 10 years down the road, having that same shipper and that repeat and referral business. I mean, you can buy a house with one shipper yeah. if you do it right. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Um, good question, Ozan. Thank you. Cat Moody, thank you for your service. Can you explain a little bit more why you needed so much cash up front, line of credit house to get started if you used factoring? Yep. I clarify that because I don't think she fully understood. Yep. So- I didn't need it because I do have a factoring company. I just don't factor everything. And even though I have my own factoring company, carriers still won't work with you, even if you have your own factoring company, because they don't trust you. Even though I could show them all the documentation that says, hey, my shipper is factorable. Um, we'll pay you, blah, blah, blah. Some carriers still won't work with you at all, even if you give them all that information, show the proof. So for me, I didn't necessarily need it, but I know by new having it, would just expedite the process and grow. Yeah. So what he was able to do, a lot of people who don't have that cash set aside to start or are willing to, you know, to, to put their house up as collateral and put a loan in place, you know, you can get these care. A lot of these carriers factored. You just won't get them all factored. 
right? And you're going to miss opportunities to cover loads because there's going to be carriers that won't, you know, won't haul for you because you're a new carrier. So what he did was he took the excuse out of the equation. He's like, Hey, I'll factor if I can, but if I can't, I've got this cash set aside and I can figure out a way to make it work. And then that also helped him build his credit faster because not only was he factoring, but he was also paying for those loads direct. And when you got your own cash, you know, you can do with it what you want. You could pay that carrier, you know, one day, seven days, 15 days, 30 days, whatever, as long as you're paying them on time and you can control your destiny there a little bit once you have that cash. But it's very doable. Most of my students start with no bankroll meaning they don't have bankroll to pay the carriers. Um, they have to use factoring. I get it. It works, but you know, uh, I think Jeffrey had that, had that resource in place because he came from a really good career and a really good job and a really understanding wife uh, uh, and, uh, and a home, right. With some equity in it. And he decided to go, you know, burn the boats, like we said before. So good question, Kat. Thank you. And um, just to piggyback off what she said. So, where I am now, if I post a load on DAT, my company's credit score is 97 out of 100 and my days to pay is 18. So literally now I'm in the position having that vision. I can cover any load really because the carrier is going to look at, is he trustworthy and does he pay fast? And because we hit those check boxes, I mean, that's how the business has been able to grow as well. So having a vision and knowing like, OK, I have to make this sacrifice to get to this point and this point. That'll help your business grow as well. It grows in steps and not leaps. So those little steps look like leaps over like a two or three year period. How long do you think it took you? I have a question for you. How long do you think it took you from moving your first load to getting to the point where you had, let's call it decent credit, maybe like B credit, you know, maybe not a 97 out of a hundred, but maybe you were in the eighties. It took about 90 days. Okay. So it was a few months. Yeah, yeah, which is realistic, which I think is realistic, right? So the first 90 days is a can be a little bit of a struggle, but once you build that credit, as long as you're paying those carriers on time, your credit's only going to go up, right? Because they're going to, just like any credit report on a personal, for a personal credit report, time is your asset. The more time you've been in business and the more loads you move, the better credit your credit's going to be. If and you don't even have to pay them early, just pay them in 30 days, yeah. right? Yeah. If you're paying 30 days consistently, you'll get a credit. Yep. Now, if you're paying them in 18 days, you'll get it faster, right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, so I love that. Yeah. All right, cool. Uh, El Padre asks Jeffrey, how do you track carriers doing during deliveries? Do you use any GPS type tracking, macro point, or something like that? What are you using to track? What's your, what TMS do you use? Yep. I use macro point um, as far as his question, as far as yep. the carriers during deliveries, you know, I kind of share our trials of when that carrier, you know, double freight broker or whatever. So it's mandatory now for, for us to use macro point for the drivers. Um, so that's how we've kind of improved and kept that customer as well. Right. As far as the TMS goes, part of that hundred thousand taking that out was to get McLeod. So we use McLeod mm. As wow. all TMS, and that's a big investment. That's like the catalog of software. So to even take that leap of faith to buy that McLeod is, is crazy. Now, from honestly, for tell them how much McLeod costs. Go ahead, go ahead. About I, I got a discount, and it was like eighty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so listen, guys, you don't hey, listen. He went out and he went big because of his background at Honda and because of his background at the freight brokerage. You know, so he was used to using like enterprise type software. And so, but I'll tell you, you don't have to start that way. Don't need it. You can absolutely get started with a free TMS like Ascend, right? You guys want to check it out. Um, Tim Hyam is a friend of mine. He's also well known in the industry. If you guys are looking for a TMS, okay, you can sign up for free without a credit card. You don't even need to put a credit card in for the trial. Freightburgerbootcamp.com forward slash TMS. Okay. If you go there and you want to not have to put your credit card in and you can get a free shipper directory, all you got to do when you sign up is in the coupon code, put FBBC, Freight Broker Bootcamp. Okay. If you put that in there, then they're going to let you sign up without a credit card and you get that TM, uh, you get that um, the free TMS. And then you can always upgrade later, but it's absolutely free. You can use it as long as you want, but you can always upgrade to a paid model afterwards. It's called a freemium model, but you can try it before you buy it type deal. So that's a great place to start. And I think even if you upgrade it, I think it's 
it's less than a hundred bucks a month, right? It's, it's, it's very affordable, but I do understand, you know, as a guy coming from big enterprise type software, where you were going with that, but, um, it, you definitely didn't have to have it. You just made that commitment because you were thinking five years down the road. And in hindsight, the, I would say that's probably the biggest mistake that I made starting a freight brokerage because you do not need that. I mean, honestly, there was a period to where the software went down. Things just happened in the household to where I didn't use it. And um, I just tra- did everything through Excel spreadsheets, Microsoft Access and uh, Microsoft Word using doc, you kind of building it, converting rate cons to PDFs. So I said that to say, if you have a high level understanding, maybe just a college level understanding of Microsoft Office, you can use Access, Excel, PowerPoint, Word, all the Microsoft documents or Office suites to have your own TMS. Like, so I would say, do not make that gigantic investment at all, unless you're ready to really grow and scale into it. Yeah. And, you know, and again, when you're not moving any loads, you don't need a whole lot of software. Nope. And you, like you said, you could track your first 10, 20, 50, 100 loads in a spreadsheet. You could track it on paper if you wanted. Yeah. So you don't have to rush into software. Okay. Um, you know, again, you know, the less moving parts, the better. The one thing you'll definitely need will be load boards, right? You'll definitely need load boards. But the TMS, that's why I offer that, um, you know, the Ascend free TMS, because I know that cash flow is critical early days and it gives you more than enough tools to start moving some loads. So, so yeah, good question there. Uh, let's see what else we got. Uh, Timothy McNeil, when the shipper pays, who decides how much the carrier gets, the broker or the agent? Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey, if you want to handle this. I mean, you know, the, I mean, it's a pretty basic question. Yeah. So in, in my business model, I let my age, I have five agents under me just to start there. So typically all of the shippers that we have, I've closed those deals myself. So my agents, they're still working on building their own book of business, still bringing on ki- shippers, things of that nature. So because I'm doing the pricing, I'll tell them like, Hey, this is how much we have in the low, say 1500. We'll look at the market on DAT or something. And say, hey, we only want to be it. We want to be firm at like 900 for when I'm about to post the load. So that way we kind of know ahead of time how much we're going to make, how much we're going to post the load for and things of that nature. So hopefully that answers your question, Tim. Yeah. So the broker controls the price to the carrier. Yeah. He sets the price or to the broker or to the shipper. I'm sorry. I'd say it's a thousand dollars. And then he controls the price to the carrier as well, based upon the margin, right? right? So he has to negotiate with the shipper on a price and they agree to it. And then he has to negotiate with the carrier on the price. So the agents, if they have their own book of business, if they have their own customers, then they will determine the rates that they're going to charge the shipper along with the shipper and they'll determine the rates they're going to pay the carriers. So they're they're basically operating as a, a broker under the brokerage, right? They really are self-sufficient, but they're using the credit and they're using the software and they're using the marketing and they're using the bankroll and the financial management of the broker to move those loads. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. Good question. A uh, question for you, Larry Roland asked, did you use LinkedIn under your business name or personal name? Did you have a, a business profile or a personal profile? How do you, how do you use it? Do it today? So I do have a business page and I have a personal page, but I I try to make the interactions more personal. So all the interactions, everything that I slide into the DMs with is under my personal page. My business page might have like maybe 100 followers, but my personal page is over 5,000 now. So you want to be as personable as possible to let them know that I'm a real person. You know, I'm telling a shipper like I, Jeffrey, will personally handle your load from start to finish which again makes you unique compared to like the big freight brokers like CH Robinson or TQL to where they'll talk to that sales guy and never hear from him again. That's just kind of how their business works. So if you're willing to personalize it and take that ownership that I'm going to do everything myself or be in control of that, I like to call it one point of care or one point of contact. That'll help you be more efficient and gain, gain more shippers as well. Yeah. I think having both a business page and a personal page is valuable But remember, people do business with people, right? And so your personal profile should not be your company name. It should not have your company logo. It should have your picture. It should have your name. And it should be optimized to you. 
because you are personally trying to build rapport with that audience. All right. Your business profile will be your company logo. It will be your company name. It will be the, the very marketing sales oriented informational information about your business, kind of like a website, right? right? So you should have both, but when you're doing outreach, you're definitely going to want you know, different content related to your niche or related to your industry or related to just logistics in general, whatever the case may be. You can post on both of those, your personal and your business. Um, they both have value, right? So I think that's a good, uh, good question and a good direction for you. Hmm. Okay, so here's a question from John Ramirez. I'm trying to get quotes from some local lanes 15 miles to 35 mile lanes. What kind of carriers should I search and call on my load board? How do I go about this? All right. Interesting. Have you done much on the local stuff? I know you said you did a lot of over the road stuff. You got any insight for John? Yeah. So one of my biggest uh, customers is Columbus City Schools here in Columbus to where we have a purchase order to move all of their local freight, picking up at their distribution center and delivering to local high schools using box trucks at that. So that's kind of another niche that we kind of grew into. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, we use DAT, but I do a lot of stuff in the city of Columbus. For example, I'm a member of the Columbus Chamber of Commerce. I'm a member of our Veterans Coalition here. So there's a lot of things that if you're looking for local lanes, I would say get involved in like your local trucking communities. We have the Ohio Transportation Association, OTA. Every state has a transportation association and there's hardly any brokers and they're all carriers who come together. So I found success just being a member of that group and meeting carriers that way to cover local movements. Yeah, I like your I like your idea on the local transportation association, um, not only at a state level, but a lot of times on a city level or a regional level, they'll have it. Um, you're probably not going to find a lot of carriers that are looking to run local on the DAT or on truck stop. You may, if there are some sort of last mile or regional type of load board or something specific to your niche, like box trucks or something like that, if it's like, uh, like Jeffrey was saying, you might be able to find some, but probably the best way to find local service where it's just 15 to maybe 30, 50 miles, even a hundred miles, that's a day trip, right? Yeah. Um, short haul stuff, stuff that's a hundred miles or less, maybe even a little bit more sometimes, but a hundred miles or less for sure. Just look for, you know, particularly, like you said, if you're now, if you need a full truck, right, if you need a 53 foot, you know, uh, trailer of some sort, well, then you got to call carriers that have that type of equipment. But a lot of that stuff you're going to find, I mean, some of it will be full truckload, but a lot of it's going to be smaller, right? It's going to be two, three, four, five pallets. So it's going to go in a box truck or it's going to be, you know, some sort of a partial or something. So just call the local carriers and just, you know, believe it or not, you're probably not going to have that many carriers that are going to do box trucks in your area. I'd be shocked if there was more than a hundred, it won't take you very long to get through them. And at that point, um, you know, you start developing relationships with them and, um, you know, who knows on the pricing side and you're going to have to make everything match up but I'm sure they're going to be looking for business just like you. And they'd be happy to work with you uh, if they trust you. So yeah, I think those are good tips. You're probably not going to find a lot on the load boards. That's a mistake that a lot of people make. They're looking to move some local freight and they go to the load boards. They don't see anything posted. That's very, very common. Okay. That's very common. You're just going to, if you're in the Columbus area, Jeffrey would pick up the phone, you know, and just call 20 or 30 box truck companies that can haul local that are looking to haul locally develop some relationships, understand some of their pricing, build some rapport, you know, get set up with them. And then at that point, he's just going to leverage them as one of his primary assets and, you know, and sell the back end and, uh, and hopefully develop, you know, some lanes in and around the area. And then, you know, he's going to have repeat and referral business on both sides. So hope that helps. Yeah, Google search is your best friend, John. Yeah. Google search and just put that in, in a, in that certain radius and just call them. Yep. Um, and even if they say they can't do it, Ask them, do you know somebody who can? There's been many a times where a guy's like, hey, I'm tied up, but I know a guy and he's referred me to a guy. So don't be scared to ask if they know somebody. Yeah, because I'll tell you, there's a lot of carriers, especially, here's the thing, especially when rates are down, they like to stay close to home. Yep. Because if they run long, 
they got to get back long. Right. So the fuel to get out there and the fuel to get back are the same, but they might only be getting paid one way. They don't want a deadhead home, but they don't mind coming home 35 or 50 miles with no load on them, right? If they can get a load back, great, but they don't mind because the miles are short, right? So they don't want to get hung out there and have to sit around for a couple of days to try to get a backhaul. So yeah, the local stuff, you'd be surprised. Sometimes it can be really profitable. All right. Uh, Question for you, Bless Logistics asks, are you alone or do you have a partner? I'm looking into a possible partner. Any thoughts? Do you have a partner? Well, he has his wife, so he definitely has at least one partner. Yeah, yeah. but no, we're, we're straight from the ground up, so we're all self-funded. Um, as far as like a collaboration, like with my company or anything, we're not looking for anything like that. Hopefully I'm answering that correctly. But um, Yeah, I think he's considering a partner and he's looking at maybe the pros and cons. Okay. Um, so let me give you my two cents. Okay. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur for 27 years in that 27 years. I've had one, two, three, I've had four partnerships. Okay. A hundred percent of them ended bad. Just my two cents. That's just me. I will never have another partner in any business that I have. Um, maybe it was me. Maybe it was them. Maybe it was both. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just letting you know that they didn't go according to Hoyle. They did not go according to plan. Now, some of them were profitable companies. Some of them we made a lot of money. But ultimately, partnerships are very challenging. There's a reason why 50% of marriages break up. And just so you know, a partnership is a marriage. As a matter of fact, it's more complicated than a marriage because in a business, you've got very, very similar to, uh, you know, uh, you know, a husband and wife getting married. But now if you have a successful business, you might have tens of millions of dollars to argue over. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to argue over $50,000 in equity in a house with your spouse than it is to argue over a $10 million business. So, there's no arguments when there's no money, right? When it's worth zero, nobody's arguing, nobody's bickering. But when it becomes worth something, now that's when the fangs come out and that's when challenges come out. So, so ultimately, again, I'm not casting any blame. I'm not pointing any fingers. I'm just letting you know there's pros and cons. If my suggestion to you, if you can in any way, shape or form, do it without a partner, that would be my choice. And that was Jeff's choice right? His choice was to not have a partner. He could have easily had a partner if he wanted and tried to diversify some of the risk, but he didn't. So that's our two cents. I think we're both on the same page now. Yep. I was a slow learner. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Uh, okay. Timothy McNeil asks, Dennis, does the broker or agent decide how much the carrier gets for a load? Okay. We answered that one. Um, whoever's customer it is, if you are the agent then you would determine, you would negotiate the rates with your shipper and you would determine the rates to your carrier. You'd negotiate that. So a thousand to the shipper, 800 to the carrier, 200 to margin, that would be something you would handle. If you're the broker, then you don't control the agent's rates. They're independent contractors. They control their own rates. The only caveat to that is if you are the broker and you have an agent that's helping you cover those loads, but it's not their customer. They're covering your loads, which is kind of what John's going through. He has a lot of people that are kind of serving more as dispatchers um, right now as they build up their book of business. So he has all the customers. They're covering his loads. But, um, but I hope that makes sense. So um, a, a, a broker agent, meaning an agent that has their own book of business, they would control their rates. Buy and sell, Okay. All right. Here's a question. Karen asks, uh, which I knew this question was going to come up. How do you get government shipments to move? How do you move government freight? How do you start getting into the government? Well, you know, honestly, government freight to get into it because I was in the military is very challenging. Right. So, you know, a lot of times you get on YouTube University and it's like, hey, I'll just start my MC and I'll just go ahead and get government freight. It really doesn't work like that. So I'm going to give you the honest answer. If you want to work with the SDDC, right, surface deployment, forgot the rest of the acronym, but the SDDC, right, they're the ones who give all the transportation contracts through the military as the primary. 
you have to have your MC for at least three years and you have to have on top of and you have to have a performance bond of one hundred thousand dollars as well. So to start even doing government contracting at a minimum, you want to be in business for at least three years or have your MC number because you're just not going to be able to get in. Even now, I just left the FEMA conference because I'm about to start doing work with FEMA as well out in D.C. They still want you to be on board for a certain amount of time. And their insurance requirements are expensive. They're outrageous. So I wouldn't even look into government contracting unless you have probably about $10,000 to spend on just insurance alone because they want like $300,000 for cargo and all kinds of things that you're going to have to jump through just to be eligible for it. So just to summarize all that, government shipments are there. I would just say wait until you've been in business for at least three years before you really pursue that. It's the surface deployment distribution center or command, yes, I think is yes, what it is. Yes. But here's the thing, guys. Gover the government has a lot of freight. There's no question about it, whether it's FEMA or GSA or SDDC or any of the different government divisions. They have a lot of freight. They're probably the largest shipper in the United States or maybe maybe the world, right? They're huge. They have a ton of freight. But here's the thing. there's You got to be in business a few years, like Jeffrey said, but you also have to understand this. We did a lot of business with the SDDC, okay? Not a lot. I mean, I don't know, five to 10 million bucks overall. So small in the big scheme of things, but at one point we were doing probably a couple million bucks a year um, with the SDDC. But what you have to understand is that when you hear about the government paying you know, a hundred dollars for a hammer. That's not how it is in freight. Mm -mm. Let me tell you about freight in, in the military. Yeah. The freight has a, uh, the SDDC has a system and it's a transparent system, meaning every carrier broker provider can see every carrier broker providers rates. Yes. So when you quote, you can see everybody's rates. So, and their objective there is to try to cut costs, right? Which is what the government should do. The government's spending our money. They should try to save money, right? So ultimately, it, you know, there's a lot of pros and cons. I'm not telling you not to pursue government freight. Um, but I am telling you that, you know, sometimes it sounds a little bit better than it is or sound, you know, gets presented with very rose colored glasses. Um, but again, there are some special requirements um, and, you know, it can be very competitive. It can also be very profitable because again, it's very relationship, you know, you can develop relationships with the transportation managers at these different facilities. Okay. You know, you were one of those people, you, you basically worked with different carriers and brokers when you were in the military. That's part of what you did. Exactly. Yes, sir. The military doesn't really use their own trucks, right? Typically for for distribution stuff. Right. So they're outsourcing a lot of that and they've got all these approved providers. So yeah, I mean, you could probably speak to it even better than me because you've been on the inside, but ultimately I think that'll, that should get you going in the right direction, but good question, Karen. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let me close this banner real quick. Oh, Hey, one more thing just before, because I, I don't want to, I know that people are going to be mad at me if they don't get this. Listen, if you guys are, you want me to become your freight broker sales coach. You want to be a part of the freight broker sales accelerator like Jeffrey and many others. I've probably, I've had well over 500 students go through that program now. Um, get on the wait list. Freightbrokerbootcamp.com forward slash wait list. It's free to get on the wait list. The program is not free. I can't tell you how much it's going to cost, but I can tell you the price is going to go up again. So get on the wait list. You'll be the first to get notified. You'll get all the details. If you want to enroll, you can enroll. But I limit that to 100 people each time, right? And it sells out in less than a week. Usually two, three, four days it sells out. So get on the wait list. It's the only way I can do it to make it fair. All right. And we're going to wrap up with a couple of questions and then we'll get you on your way because you've got a busy, let's see. We got, we got one more question and then you got to go. All right. Let's see. Boom, boom, boom. Let's see either of you. Let me just make sure here I don't skip a bunch of people. Uh, ba -ba. He answered that already. Okay. So Michael 46 says, hello, Dennis. Thank you for your time. Is it 
common normal thing for big brokerages that considering me as a freight agent to ask me for a list of customers I plan to talk to before hiring me. Okay, so let me give you my perspective and, and Jeffrey, you can chime in on this if you, if you want to. So what you're saying, let me restate the question. You are looking to become a freight agent and you're reaching out to brokerages and those brokerages are asking you for a list of your customers, the company names before you go, uh, before they approve you or before they bring you on board. I hope that's correct. If that's correct, um, my answer to you is it varies. Yes, I know there are companies that will do that. And I also know there's companies that don't. Now, we as a brokerage and my brokerage, we didn't ask for the names of the customers before you came on board, but we did require you because we didn't hire brand new brokers. We required validation, which was commission stubs, commission checks, commission reports. You could, you know, you could redact the company name and stuff like that. But ultimately, we only hired agents who had a book of business. Not when we first started, but by the time I left, we had 80 offices throughout the U.S. And you really had to have a book of business in order to be a part of our business. But um, if you're if you're looking to become a brand new broker and you don't have customers and all they're asking you is for a list of potential shippers you're going to call, what's the harm? Right. I mean, they're not really your customers. If they're just asking you for a list of customers you're going to reach out to, just identify the niche that you're really going to go after make a list of customers, let them know. What they're trying to do, I think, is they're trying to understand if they're, they or their agents are already doing business with those shippers. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to avoid you stepping on their toes, yep. right? So in my system, in my brokerage, we had, a, we had it built into our TMS because we built our entire TMS. You think he spent a lot of money on his TMS? I, I invested over a million dollars in mine, okay? Ooh. Insane. But anyway, point being, um, we had a system where you could go in and you could type in the com customer's name and then it would tell you if that customer was already dedicated to another broker, right? If it was already assigned to another agent, then you wouldn't call that customer because they were already dedicated. They were already assigned. If it wasn't, then you feel free to call it. So that's how we had it set up. I don't know how the other companies do it, but it's probably they probably have something similar because they do want to make sure that you're not calling on their existing customers. So that would be my bet. What's your take on that, Jeffrey? I, I agree with you. I would say, Michael, just be positive. To me, it just sounds like they're just vetting you to one, make sure you understand what you're getting into because a lot of people probably reach out to them and say, hey, I want to be an agent, but what does that really mean? So, yeah, they don't have a plan. Yeah, you got to have a plan. Yes, sir. And the second thing is what Dennis said is, making sure that you're not stepping on anybody's toes or they don't already have that as like a house account, so to speak. Um, so you're not calling anything that they already have a relationship with. Yeah, that's another challenge. And we could kind of leave for another episode of going to big brokers direct. Yeah. Like for example, if you try to sign up for Landstar as an agent, okay? Um, Landstar has a lot of positive things associated with their company. They've got a lot of resources. They've got a big brand. They've got technology. They've got their own trucks, blah, 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 blah. But if you want to become an agent, the challenge you have for Landstar is that all of the key accounts are already dedicated to other brokers because they've been around for as long as brokerage has been around. Yep. Okay. So you can't do business with any of those accounts that are already dedicated to other agents or our, our, or our house accounts. So it limits your opportunity when you're going to big brokers a lot of times, right? Yep. So imagine if you tried to find a customer that CH Robinson or TQL or, or Landstar hasn't done business with in the last five years. You know, it's going to be like, you're going to have to turn over a lot more stones than you would if you found a small to medium sized company, for example. And I, and I know Jeffrey's not hiring agents right now. Maybe he will be in the future, um, and I would recommend you guys connect with him on LinkedIn. He and I are connected. You guys could check him out on LinkedIn. But the point is, if you went to work with a guy like him, who's doing a, you know, who's going to do a million dollars in business this year, you know, he hasn't done business with 99.9% .9 of the shippers out there. So you now have a huge advantage to start cultivating and generating those relationships before they're already dedicated. That's the advantage of some of the advantages of working with a smaller broker who's got, uh, who's looking to grow. So you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I would say, you know, I kind of mentioned in part of my testimony, I worked for DHL. DHL is a mega 
three PL as well. And that was the same pain point that I had working from them is they work with everybody. Like if you're doing any international or global shipping, DHL, those big orange reddish letters are everywhere. So it's the same thing. And if you're looking as an agent, I would say try to find a small to medium sized brokerage. I mean, even now my agents with their commission, they're still making close to over $50,000 a year and they're just running off of my book of business. So there's still a lot of opportunity there as well. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Listen, um, we're going to wrap it up guys. Thank you so much for being here. Jeffrey, thank you so much for taking all the extra time. I held you over and I apologize for that. I know you're, I'm, you're probably getting taxed. Your email's blowing up. Uh, your wife is probably looking for you and you got five agents that you've got to babysit. So I'm sure that you got a lot of work to do. Hey, listen, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on all your success. Keep me posted on how things go this year. Maybe we'll have you back next year for an update. Um, anything you want to add or can they connect with you on LinkedIn? Yes. Yes. Please connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I have a heart to serve a heart to help. This industry is big enough for everybody. So if there's any way that I can help you or give you some encouragement, um, even my tagline is CEO, chief encouragement officer. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm here for you. Love it. And if you guys are curious about becoming a freight broker, freight agent, check out freightbrokerbootcamp.com. Again, trained over 10,000 students um, and we offer a 60 day, 100% unconditional money back guarantee. Thank you, Jeffrey. Appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next Monday with another freight broker bootcamp live. Hang tight, Jeffrey. <laughs>